Today, I have a special guest, Jonathan Ginsberg, an experienced disability attorney licensed for 29 years of Ginsberg Law Offices to help us out understand disability as it pertains to multiple sclerosis. I'll include some resources in the links below, including a free disability survival kit that you can check out from his website and also a form if you're looking into his services. We don't have any financial relationship. Uh, thank you for coming on to do the interview. My pleasure. Nice to be here. Uh, so how are things going in Atlanta overall in terms of the pandemic and everything else? I know your life has changed a lot. It has. The last year has been really uh, weird uh, in that we went from, in the disability world at least, we went from doing live hearings in front of administrative law judges to everything being done by phone. And I will tell you, I'm usually pretty critical of Social Security because of the long delays and some of the issues that uh, they've had. But they did a pretty good job, I have to say, in moving from basically live hearing to telework and video and telephone hearings really within about a month period of time. So we went from really nothing happening. There was about a month there from mid-February to mid-March, let's say, last year when everything stopped. And then I'd say by the end of March of 2020, they started doing telephone hearings. Um, and they've actually become more efficient, I think, because they can use, they can, they can assign judges literally from any place in the country to a hearing any other place in the country. The hearing delays have gone down. Um, I've been able to actually grow my practice a little bit just because I'm able to do hearings uh, all over the country. I'm not limited to Georgia or Atlanta. I can do hearings in any state because uh, it's done by phone or video. So, you know, it's just been a very different experience. Um, you know, one nice thing is I don't have to wear suits, <laughs> which is really kind of kind of nice. Um, you know, having to, I do my hearings. I'm in a T-shirt and shorts, uh, which is really kind of nice. Although I think with the video hearings, they're going to be adding, I'll have to get dressed up, at least uh, from the waist up. Uh, but uh, it has been uh, definitely a very interesting experience, but, uh, you know, you really see, and I'm sure you've seen it too, the effect that COVID has had on, on people in terms of their health. Um, and I think it looks like we're hopefully seeing the, the end of the pandemic. I know here in Georgia and Atlanta, they've, a lot of places have lifted uh, some of the masking requirements and, and all that, but uh, we still have a ways to go. And I'm obviously a very you know concerned about this Indian variant that that's, I think has finally reached our shores. So, we got a ways to go, but I think uh, hopefully things have uh, maybe turned the corner. How about things out in L.A.? Things are looking pretty good in Los Angeles, and I'm definitely optimistic. Hopefully the next few months things will be a lot better. Uh, it was terrible here in January and December, but it's looking pretty good right now. But I'm glad to hear there's at least a few good things that rose out of the pandemic, you know, using technology. And hopefully yep. people with disabilities won't have these ridiculous wait times to get disability insurance and get their hearing and everything. Yeah, absolutely. No, at its worst, I mean, I was seeing cases literally three years from the time this money applied before they got to a hearing. And I'd get these calls and Jonathan, what am I supposed to eat? How am I supposed to live? I have no money coming in for you know, two and a half, three years. And there was no answer to that. And now, you know, again, being even a year is too long, 15 months is too long, but it's better than, than, uh, than in two years or three years. So again, kudos to Social Security for becoming more efficient in that regard. And I hope that uh, that trend continues because um, again, it's, uh, you know, folks fighting for disability, uh, it is definitely a challenge. And I think that we're only beginning to see some of what they call long haulers, uh, folks who've had the COVID who are having kind of residual issues, either because of another uh, another issue they've had, another medical problem they've got in the COVID on top of that, or people who just have, you know, kind of a long-term fatigue, breathing issues uh, from COVID. I talked to a gentleman this morning who had it. Uh, he's got really bad diabetes. And he says, you know, every couple of weeks, you have these episodes of just intense fatigue that, you know, he relates back to his having COVID. So, uh, again, we, we have a long way to go. It'll be interesting to see how this all pans out. Yeah, we'll see. I've seen some of these chronic complications myself, unfortunately. Um, well, so to start off, you know, I know you mostly focus on SSDI, but can you just tell us a little bit about SSDI in general? And are, are there other types of disability claims that people file? Sure. Um, social Security Disability, I mean, everybody is, is pretty much knows about Social Security Retirement which is the type of disability one gets at a certain age, whether it's 62 for early retirement or 65 for uh, full retirement age or even 69 or 70 for extended retirement. But that same trust fund also administers a disability program. And the biggest difference is with retirement, you qualify based on your age and your lifetime earnings. Disability is based on you proving as the claimant that you meet their definition of disability, which is being unable to engage in substantial gainful activity 
or a simple entry-level job because of a medically determinable condition or conditions that has lasted or is expected to last 12 consecutive months or result in death. And they also look, so there's a, a definition of it. There's a severity definition. There's a duration requirement. And it's also, they look at the 10-year period, not lifetime. So they look at the last 10 years before you became disabled. So somebody who worked for 20 years and has not worked for the last 15, they're not going to qualify for the disability insurance benefit. There is an SSI component, which is kind of a welfare benefit, same definition of disability, but a lot of issues with that. So you have the, the social security disability, which is what mo mostly what I do. Uh, folks who have paid into the system, who are trying to get money out based on being disabled. Uh, you have the SSI, which is the welfare end of it. There are also long-term disability policies provided by private insurance companies, uh, sometimes company provided, sometimes uh, people buy it on their own, that sometimes has a kind of a crazy interface with the social security disability program offsets and things like that. Um, so I, I don't really deal with that very much. Uh, I've done some of that work. Some states do have state disability. I think California does have a state disability program. I know other states do. Um, I don't deal with that at all. Um, and of course, then you have the workers' compensation. You have other types of uh, programs that deal with people who are injured. But there's a there's a it's a safety net. Many components to it. And again, my role, my focus is primarily on the national uh, United States government Social Security Administration disability program, which is based on somebody's inability to uh, work. Okay, so let's say someone with multiple sclerosis is applying for SSDI. You know, what are your experiences in general? Like, uh, do these claims typically get accepted? You know, what would you say your success rate is and who gets accepted and who tends to get rejected? Yeah, um, I think MS cases usually are pretty solid in the disability world because most judges realize that it's a chronic condition. There is no cure for it. And in many cases, it can become progressively worse over time. As you've pointed out in a couple of the videos I've watched, many people with MS, you know, may be in remission or may be fairly stable for long periods of time and may not be disabled in the sense that they could do some kinds of work. So obviously when I'm looking at an MS case, um, you know, the question I'm going to ask is, you know, what is your functioning? How, uh, you know, how has this impacted you, whether it's physically in terms of walking, using of your hands, things like that, as well as cognitively? or other issues that, that one might have from MS. And again, what I'm looking for, what Social Security be looking for, is a level of severity that would prevent that person from doing a simple entry-level job. So the way to think of this would be, if I said to you, you know, someone, let's say, has been an executive assistant someplace, or they've been a, a foreman, foreperson at a factory, or they've been a lawyer, or a doctor, or an engineer, they can't do that anymore. Let's accept that. Could they be a ticket taker to a movie theater? Could they be a greeter at Walmart? Could they pack things in a small box? Could they inspect surveillance system or surveillance monitors? Could they observe textiles coming down an assembly line? So a lot of times, one of the messages I have to send is, you know, the issue is, could you do a simple entry-level job, setting aside that it's minimum wage, setting aside you'd be bored out of your mind, setting aside you're way overqualified for it. Could you do it eight hours a day, five days a week, ongoing. And so that's the level of severity. But as a starting point, if one has MS because of the nature of that condition, and I'll go into sort of the different theories of disability uh, in a minute, but uh, the nature of the condition, many judges find that it is, um, as a starting point, they will accept that this is a medically determinable condition with objective test findings. And so it's a good starting point if the person, um, in fact, does have the functional limitations that would ultimately qualify him or her for disability. You know, so you kind of mentioned about the function from the illness, not just the diagnosis itself. So, yeah. you know, some people, they have a very objective findings like severe visual impairment or mobility limitations. But a lot of the times people with multiple sclerosis have symptoms that are severe, but maybe a little bit more subjective, like cognitive impairment or severe chronic pain or severe disabling fatigue. How do you prove that you're disabled if you have those types of symptoms? Well, I mean, there are a couple of ways, and that, that's actually a very good question, because that's usually what, when we get to a hearing, that's what we're dealing with, because there may be some objective sign, signs, but some of the you know, subjective nature of some of the issues that a person might be dealing with may be harder to prove. So obviously, one thing would be 
They're going to look at the longitudinal treatment record. How long have they gone to the doctor? What are the complaints that are being made to the doctor? Are they consistent? Does the treating physician find the person credible? Does the treating physician find these symptoms are consistent with the objective findings uh, as well? So that is the person, is there any evidence of malingering or drug-seeking behavior? which again, usually you don't find that. Um, I may try to get non-medical evidence in the form of statements from former coworkers or supervisors discussing the problems a person had at work. I may ask for statements from friends or even family members. What changes have you seen in this person in terms of their function and of course their testimony about the issues they've had. Um, I may provide they're on certain medications that have uh, known side effects. I may put that in my pre-hearing brief. This person is on this medication, which uh, has known side effects of this, and this is what the person's complaining of. Um, so again, a judge is looking at this very holistically. Is there a credibility, you know, is there a credibility problem? Is a person believable? So even if some of these symptoms cannot be uh, objectively tested, you can't do an MRI or a CT to find it, you can still do objective testing. I know as a physician, I'm sure you're, you're you know, asking questions to determine, is this person telling me something that's consistent with what I'm finding. So, you know, we can, we can look for a broad range of evidence to ultimately prove that this individual's uh, level of symptomology is consistent with what the objective evidence shows, what the physician believes, and again, what a third, uh, you know, not, a non-interested third parties might believe or family members might tell us. But again, a judge is, is kind of weighing all those type of things uh, at a hearing. Um, so that's, that's how you sort of put together a case. Yeah, I have at times referred patients to see a neuropsychologist if they have a lot of cognitive symptoms just to sort of document the severity of that yep. instead of just writing it more casually and informative, informally in my notes. Um, you know, but I, I have to say, like, from the doctor's perspective, sometimes I'm a little bit bewildered as to why certain patients of mine get denied when it seems obvious to me they should qualify. Mm -hmm. Like you being experienced in doing this, are there certain red flags on an application from the, the judge's perspective where it's like, okay, yeah, this person's probably going to get denied. What would you say are the red flags? Well, I mean, and, and let me back it up a little bit because there's different stages of an, of an application. When one files an application, the, the claim goes to actually a division of the state. You're in California, so a division of the California uh, state government that does disability evaluations under contract with the um, federal government. So at the initial level, the first level of appeal, the adjudicators or claims adjusters are looking for what I would call listing level impairment. And listings or social securities identified in the case of MS, and I believe it's listing 11.04. Let me just double check that. Uh, uh, no, it's not 11.04. It is 11.09. Um, uh, They're looking at listing 11.09. And I've, I've made a copy of that in the materials I, I made available to you prior to this. So people can look at it. So if the level of severity of MS is at 11.09 levels and the doctor and the medical records are supportive of that, the treating doctor either writes a narrative or checks off, fills out a checklist I provide, then we can possibly get them approved early. But many people don't reach the listing level because they don't exactly qualify that way. So one reason someone might get denied early is either A, they do not meet the listing, be something as simple as the adjudicator requests medical records and the claimant has given the wrong address. I mean, you would be surprised how many times I look at a, at a, a file and the claimant gave the treatment office address as opposed to the office, the address for medical records. Um, you know, as you well know, many medical providers use medical copying services. And I will, again, it's, it's eye-opening to me the first question I, first thing I do when I get involved in the case is I have my, my staff people, one of my staff people go make a list of all the medical providers and identify the proper mailing address to get medical records and how much they charge for them, things like that. So we can make sure that the adjudicators have that. If they don't have it, they will deny the case because they don't have the medical records. Something as simple as that. So many times, or the adjudicator, there's a certain amount of time for the records to come in. It doesn't come in in time. They just deny it, kick it on down the road because they need to get the files out of their office. So a lot of people who are deserving get denied at the initial level because the medical record does not exactly line up with the listing at 11.09. Doesn't yeah. mean they're not disabled, just means they didn't get that. Um, beyond that, um, you know, a judge might look at it and, and, you know, the same way there may be something missing 
the person, if they didn't have an attorney, for example, may not have known how to update his, his or her medical records. That's a big part of what we do is once a hearing is requested, update the medical records. Uh, sometimes we have to ask the doctor the right questions, you know, to, to explain why this person's really to help the doctor translate medical issues into specific vocational concerns because the vocational issue is the main thing in a disability case. Um, there are other judges who, for some reason, take a really hard line about what it means to be disabled. Um, one of the, my biggest gripes with Social Security is you may have in a hearing office, you know, say 20 judges. Judge A may approve 17% of his cases. Judge B may approve 80% of her cases. You may get the wrong judge and just you're out of luck. I mean, something as simple as that. So there's a lot of um, arbitrariness, let's say, to disability process. And a lot of it's just making sure that all the documentation is done correctly. And sometimes if it's not, people that clearly are disabled um, don't get approved. Again, the biggest thing I would say is not giving Social Security what it needs in terms of vocational issues. It's not about a diagnosis. You alluded to this before. Walking into disability, the hearing office saying, I've been diagnosed with MS, that doesn't mean you're going to get approved. What does that mean? How severe is the level? How does it affect you in terms of your functioning in your daily life, your activities of daily living, plus in a potential work environment? And you've got to ask those questions. You've got to make it clear to the judge, this is what's going on. And you've got to come across as being credible to the judge and explain exactly why, despite the fact that your, your desire to work, your, your intent, your, your hope to go back to work, you simply can't. Not that you won't. You're a reluctant claimant. So all these things go into it. It's, it's a very you know, holistic, big picture type of thing to get somebody ready for a hearing because, again, they've been waiting two years. They got 45 minutes to make their case. Let's do it right. Yeah. So, you know, another thing is I was fishing on Twitter for some questions and someone told me they were still working, but they were sort of getting worse. They questioned their ability to continue. So maybe some people are working less part time, making less money. Is it possible to get qualified for SSDI if you're still working full or part time? It is, but it's really hard. And the main reason is because I think judges in the disability world and adjudicators certainly, these are the people at the state agency, they see disability in black and white terms, either you're disabled or you're not. And if you're working part-time, there is a number of them. But there's something called substantial gainful activity, which is, again, the concept of being able to work full-time. It is defined in many ways, but one of them is um, for 2021, this changes every year, are you earning $1,310 a month gross? Um, if you are, then you're considered to be working. Well, let's say somebody's working part-time, they're earning $950 a month. They're earning you know, $1,100 a month, and maybe they go to $1,400 of the next, next month, and they're back below at the third month. Well, a judge looks at that, and, and he's, he or she's going to say, you know, if this person put a little more effort in, what if they had a e little bit easier job? They could get to that 1300 What if they, they got a little more overtime? How do I know this person's not suppressing his or her hours? So it just it muddies the water. And a confused mind always says no. So, you know, even though I realize people sometimes have to work and, and they want to work many times, but, it, you know, and, and, there's, and it's not a problem if they try and they fail. But ongoing part-time work, you know, more than six $700 a month, it just it muddies the waters enough where I think it makes a substantial difference as to whether you get approved or not. So the answer would be yes, you can in theory be working if you're earning less than thirteen hundred and ten dollars again for twenty two thousand twenty one. Uh, yes, you can still win. It's just really much more difficult to do so. I realize life gets in the way. You got to eat. Some of people have to do it. So. I just, I really look at how much they're earning, how consistent they are, and it just means I have to have more and stronger evidence to try to win those cases. So practically speaking, it could make things more difficult, could right? Make Everything else being equal, I'm, I'm going to have a stronger argument for a person who has not been able to work, you know, for the last year and a half, two years, as a person who's been working continuously part-time. Now, a person who's worked for a couple months and they stop because they can't, they have a relapse, they have complications, you know, that, that's a good thing. That shows they've got a good faith effort. They're trying to work. But again, ongoing work is where you run into trouble, in my, in my opinion, in my experience. Okay. Well, you know, so you touched on this earlier, but some of my patients, maybe they're part-time or they've had gaps in work, and you can run into this time-last-insured problem. You touched on yeah. it earlier. Can you elaborate that on a little bit? 
Yes, and, and again, remember that the disability uh, program it looks at the like said the ten year for most people, and if you're younger, it's going to be a little bit less than that. But generally speaking, have you worked for five out of the last ten years, ending the year you become disabled, the time you become disabled? So if somebody is and, and basically to earn a credit, um, it, there is a, a number, and basically um, it gives us this this uh, SGA approximately SGA number. Um, round numbers, if you're $5,500 a year, you get all four credits. Um, and the number changes every year as far as what it takes to earn a credit. If you earn five, $600 you know, a month um, and you do that sort of continuously, you may earn one or two credits in a year. But if you don't have um, 20 credits within that appropriate five, you know, 10 year period of time, five out of 10 years, you could, by working part time continuously, you could run out of insured credits. And so sometimes I'll see people you know, they've stopped working and they and, and then the medical comes in three or four years later and they're and we're recording this in May of 21. Their date last insured may be November of 20, November of 19. So I've got to prove their disability began two years ago, three years ago. Much more difficult to do. So yeah, part-time work can interfere with their ability to maintain enough credits. And like I said, it's, it's about you know fifty five hundred dollars a year round numbers. I tell people. If you're earning six grand a year, you're probably going to be okay for all four credits. But someone earning two thousand dollars a year, fifteen hundred dollars, zero for a couple of years, they could very easily run out of credits and take themselves out of the disability program. The point being, you have people that, in good faith, want to work as much as they can, as long as they can, without knowing they're doing this. They're sabotaging their disability case because they're not getting enough money in the system to earn enough credits. So again, that's why I tell everybody I talk to. When you can go to your My Social Security, um, My Social Security uh, online, download your statement, and see what your earnings look like. See if you're still insured for disability purposes. And if it looks you start seeing some zeros, or you have an attorney like me look at it and say you're running out of credits, you know, then you may have to make a decision: do you want to keep fighting to stay employed, or do you want to say, okay, now it's time to pursue disability? Okay, and so let's head way into the idea, like, when do people actually need an attorney? Some people try to file themselves. I know you yeah. may have a little bit of bias here, but when do you think someone needs a disability attorney? Yeah, I, I think that, look, I mean, I would, if I could avoid paying an attorney for something, I would avoid paying an attorney. No reason to. And, and at the initial stage, I used to be very adamant about this. You don't need an attorney to file your application for benefits, and you don't. You really go ssa.gov slash apply for disability, and you could do it on your own. Um, you know, some people find that it's, it's a really confusing process. More and more, I'm finding people wanting me to actually get it filed so we can try to get them approved early. Um, again, the way to get to win early is you've got to meet a listing. And that means you've got to not only have the medical records there, but you've got to ask your doctor to provide either a narrative report or some sort of a checklist on the listing. You know, people who are not attorneys may not know how to do that. On the other hand, if the medical record is you have a person who, you know, cannot walk, uh, they have significant cognitive issues, they have, you know, very limited use of their hands, and they've got visual issues, swallowing issues, whatever the other uh, problems they may have, they may not need an attorney. There's no harm in trying to get approved on your own. Um, same with the reconsideration, the first appeal. They, they file their case. It takes about three or four months. Um, and what I do, by the way, and it just as a tip, if you're going to do it on your own, make sure to tell the adjudicator, tell Social Security when you apply, please evaluate this as a listing level impairment under listing 11.09. 11.09, tell them you think you're listing level. Uh, that way, you know, you improve your chances of getting approved. So, you know, you don't need an attorney to apply. The recon appeal is, is a five-minute process. You don't need an attorney for that either. You get to a hearing, you need an attorney. You don't want to go into a hearing without a lawyer. But I don't object to, I don't get offended by anybody who wants to try to apply on their own. Um, you know, there is some benefit to having an attorney do it. Certain details get taken care of. I'm able to get them approved a little bit early. Um, but, you know, is it worth in, in the way? And, and also, by the way, the way we get paid um, is we get a percentage of past due benefits. Early on, it may not be much past due benefits. So there have been cases where I've been hired by somebody to get them approved early. I get them approved and I get their zero fee because there's no past due benefits. Where my fee is two or three hundred dollars. Well, I'd argue that's it's worth it in that situation. Um, but even if, if they choose to do it on their own, just you know, do your research. I've got a, a huge video channel. They can learn about this as much as they want. But I don't get, I don't get uh, in any way, shape, or form, I don't get um, 
offended by somebody who wants to do it without an attorney. Yeah, you know, so to segue into that, you talked about the fees. People want to know, like, what will the disability benefit be? Like, how do they calculate that exactly? Well, again, they can go to their My Social Security statement, which they used to send these out. Um, if you've been around for a while, they used to send out your statement every year where it would tell you what your, uh, your benefit amount would be at retirement, what your benefit what amount would be for disability. Now you have to go online uh, to My Social Security. Uh, just type in My Social Security in Google. You'll get to there, get to it. It'll tell you what your benefit amount would be. Um, it'll tell you if you're insured. So it's a lot of good information there. Um, you know, it's kind of, there's also some calculators on the Social Security site, which will give you an estimate as to how much your monthly benefit will be. You know, I've seen it sometimes it's $1,000, sometimes it's $2,500, sometimes it's $3,000. It just depends on what you've paid in over the last 10 years in particular. Uh, but that's how you, that's really the best way to find out. And I can, once I'm in a case, I can access a client's electronic Social Security folder and I can usually see what their benefit amount would be. And also uh, with regard to the benefit amount, if a claimant has dependent children, they, those children will be available, would be eligible for what they call auxiliary benefits, which would be 25% of the primary beneficiary's benefit, not doesn't subtract from it, it's an addition to. So if you have a person who's getting $1,000 a month, they have three children, each of those children will get $250 a month. It doesn't, and it's just in addition to what the primary beneficiary would get. Well, so, you know, if it's based on the last 10 years, if someone goes down to part-time work, makes less money, pays less taxes, that could potentially reduce correct. their benefit. That's correct. Yeah, that's a very difficult situation. I've seen some teachers in my area run into that problem with CalPERS, our local yep. teacher's pension. And, you know, they say, I can't go down to part-time work because it'll affect my income for the rest of my life. It's, it's yeah, difficult. That's, that's exactly right. It, it's, a, it's a tough call because... Look, I admire anybody, whether it's MS or any condition, who is trying to work. I mean, I think that's the goal here. And disability should be seen as a last resort. Again, I tell my clients, you want to come across as a reluctant claimant. You don't want to be somebody who's invested in the idea of being disabled, who's given up, who sees themselves as a disabled person, because that attitude comes through. If a judge picks up an attitude of entitlement, that can hurt your case. But if a person is shown that comes across as a fighter, that's a really positive thing. Judges appreciate that. I've had judges say many times to me in hearings, you know, or I said to my client, you know, I really admire your long work history. You've really put in a, you know, years and years, you've obviously thought this, but on the other side, like as you pointed out, if you if you start going part time too much, it starts to impact your benefit amount. And that, you know, there's an old saying, no good deed goes unpunished. This is an example of that. Right. And it's, it's, it's very unfortunate that people have to make that really tough choice. Do I pursue disability or do I keep working? Right, right. Now, you know, some people, they may be younger when they become disabled or they may not have enough credits because they didn't have much income. They could still get SSI, right? Is that right? They could. SSI, again, is a welfare program. Um, it is a, they look at your household income. Uh, they look at other income and resources you may have. So unfortunately, they call them deeming rules. So if, you have, if you're an SSI claimant, and the, the benefit amount is also capped, I think it's for 2021, $791 is the most you would get. Although you become eligible for Medicare immediately versus the SSDI program, Medic, uh, I'm sorry, SSI Medicaid, immediately SSDI Medicare, two years from the date of your first eligibility for payment. So it's not quite as beneficial in that regard. Uh, but SSI is less desirable because of the offsets. Um, I will say this, a younger person does not need as many credits. So, you know, there are times I've had people that are in their 20s and early 30s, they may only need, instead of five out of 10 years, they may need three and a half out of seven, they may need four out of eight. Uh, you know, they may even need, you know, two out of four. So again, you can look at, at your my social security statement or talk to an attorney, and you may find that you could hang on for another six months, another year, you could go from being SSI to being an SSDI grandfathered in uh, if you can manage to get those credits. And then there's, I'm not going to go into detail, but there's something called adult disabled child for people who become disabled uh, and they're, if it's a parent on Social Security, they can use that parent's earnings record uh, and, and claim on that as well. Again, it's sort of a different topic, but there's different ways to skin the cat as it were. And you know, one of the things I always look at when I'm talking to a younger person is, how do we get you into the SSDI universe, it's far preferable in my view to SSI. 
Yeah, my understanding is like SSI, because it's a welfare program, they look at other sources of income and your assets, whereas SSDI, you could have other assets and that sort of doesn't count against you. Is that right? In fact, one of the things with SSDI, I get this question a lot. What if I have a stock portfolio? I'm giving dividends. What if I have um, a pension from an employer? That doesn't hurt you. What if I'm getting long-term disability? Doesn't hurt you. What if I have a crude vacation or a crude sick leave? Doesn't hurt you. SSI, it does. So all these things, you know, SSD, a much more robust program, much preferable in, in almost every way uh, to get into that, that program if you possibly can. Okay. Now, you know, if you get qualified for SSDI, are you sort of in it for life or do they check on you periodically to make sure you're still disabled? How does that work? Yeah. I mean, the Social Security has really um, put a lot of effort into increasing what they call continuing disability reviews. In fact, the limited budgets, you know, Social Security is there's always a budget fight because Congress, there's a narrative in Congress, everybody in social security disability is fraudulent and they, they try to keep cutting it back and they don't allocate money for it. Where they're putting money in is these reviews. Um, generally speaking, younger people are going to be re- reviewed more often. The judges many times will put in there, I think this person should re- be reviewed at one year or at three years. MS, my experience has been these are five-year reviews, which means that they're not going to review you as a practical matter. Because again, it's not a condition that spontaneously resolves. If you have, let's say you got on disability because you have two bad knees and you you just need to get the knee replaced, knees replaced, they're going to review you and probably cut you off if you have the surgery uh, or if you don't have the surgery, no good reason for it. But MS, you know, it's just unlikely you're going to just, you know, spontaneously get better. Um, So probably not something that is going to be a a real problem. Uh, I, I can't recall the last MS client I've had who's gotten reviewed. So I think as a practical matter, not really a big issue. And by the way, if you do get qualified for disability, especially for something like MS, which is going to be kind of a long-term thing, you can use that diagnosis and that finding of disability to go and get your student loans forgiven, which is another thing. If you're in a five-year review calendar, uh, the Department of Education will consider that uh, almost determinative and, and get your student loans either greatly reduced or eliminated which can be another benefit of getting a disability program. Now, you know, a lot of people, maybe they get qualified for disability, but they want to work just a little bit and make a small amount of income. Is that okay? Will that count against you? What about like volunteer work even? Yeah, I mean, it's okay in the sense that Social Security really encourages people to go back to work. Again, part of this theme that they want to get people off the disability roles. As a practical matter, very few do get off once they're on, but they do have... um, something called a nine-month um, trial work period, where if you, once you're on disability, you can work for up to nine months um, and earn as much as you want. You can earn $10,000 a month. It doesn't affect your disability benefit. Nine months in any five-year period of time. So certainly somebody trying to work would need to be aware of the trial work period limits. I think it's, I want to say 980 a month. And that, again, that changes. So I, I don't have it in front of me, but approximately less, a little bit less than $1,000 a month gross. Um, if they earn that, they're going to use up one of the trial work period months. Um, if they're earning three, four, five, six hundred dollars a month, they're going to be below the trial work period. That's probably not going to trigger a review because again, Social Security has this, there's a balance. They don't want to discourage people from working. If they reviewed everybody who tried to work, then they're going to discourage people from trying to work. So my experience has been someone who's working part-time again, after they've been approved. So you notice there's a difference between pre-approval and post-approval. Once they've been approved and they're working part-time, five, six, seven hundred dollars a month will not necessarily hurt them, probably will not trigger a review, especially if they've got medical support saying this is the extent of what they can do. Um, You know, once you get beyond that number and they start to get close to that trial work period month, that starts to move the pendulum a little bit. They they might trigger a a review. But generally speaking, it is not a problem to do some part-time work, some volunteer work, with the caveat that you may be asked to have your doctor explain that this is all you can do. This is the extent of your capacity for substantial work. Uh, this, you know, three, four hours a, a week, you know, five, ten hours a week, or you know, five, six hundred dollars a month, that sort of thing. 
Yeah. Now, the other thing some people have concern with is that I know when you file a disability claim, they want you to sort of do everything you can to get better. But sometimes people with multiple sclerosis, they may be offered treatments that are immunosuppressants or have other unwanted side effects, and they may not follow their doctor's advice legitimately in many cases. Is that sort of going to count against you? Only if you have no good reason for it. So in other words, if you were to prescribe a medication with severe side effects, whether it's cognitive or effect on some other organ or, you know, just something that was, that was, you know, really, really dangerous, you know, that for some people might have the effect of, you know, even putting their life in jeopardy. If you can, you know, elucid, you can spell it out very clearly why you chose not to undergo this experimental treatment or why this dangerous medication that yes, it has a potential to give you some benefit, but you chose not to do it. In the case of someone with an orthopedic problem that you did not want to have back surgery, for example, as long as you can explain why you chose not to do that, and that's a good reason and your doctor understands and recognizes, yes, th there is a, a reasonable uh, choice. I mean, you can't, if there's a treatment with very minimal side effects that you know can benefit you and, you and you say, I'm not doing that, you know, I think Social Security can say no, that's not reasonable. But if it's something that has some danger to you, and again, you can explain, you've researched, you understand why, they will not hold that against you. Okay. And sort of along the same lines, some people may prefer more alternative treatments, you know, and they may be seeing acupuncturists following certain diets, not really have a lot of medical care from doctors or other providers. Does that count against you? Yes, that can, because Social Security has identified some medical providers or some healthcare providers as alternative medication or alternative providers, for example, chiropractic, uh, to, sh to the chagrin of a lot of people that I, that, you know, have back problems, for example, they consider that to be alternative medicine. Um, I think uh, uh, acupuncture, the same thing. So those type of records are not going to carry very much weight in Social Security. And they, they've actually got something called the rulings where Social Security has published where they identify. And I can put that in the uh, the, the, the webpage that, I, that I, I made available to you so folks can look at it. Um, what is considered an alternative medical provider? And yes, if you choose not to follow traditional um, medicine, Western medicine, and you choose to take magic mushrooms, or you choose to go to a chiropractor, that can hurt you because what, what Social Security is going to say is you did not you know, follow the uh, most reasonable, most logical, proven uh, practices to get better. Not to say you can't do that in addition to your ongoing treatment, but unless you have a traditional medical provider that says, you know, yes, this is a reasonable thing to do, those alternative treatments um, that really have, you know, not been, you know, undergone, you know, double wand studies and all the things that are done to, to document that sort of thing, uh, that will uh, run afoul of Social Security and judges will basically say, in effect, you have not sought treatment. So, you know, you've not done everything you can to get better and they can hold that against you and they can use that to deny because they would basically say, had you followed traditional medical treatment, you likely would have gotten better. Uh, therefore, I'm not going to approve you on that basis. Okay. Um, and then can we transition a little bit? I know this isn't your main focus of your practice, but to private disability insurance, some mm -hmm. of my more fortunate patients, yep. you know, they have good jobs and they have private disability and, you know, they actually get like a pretty good benefit. What's your success rate or experiences with multiple sclerosis and private disability? Um, with private disability, the, the big difference is that those policies typically have their own definition of disability. So for example, the policy may provide that you are disabled if you cannot perform the duties of your occupation. Well, again, let's say that you are a forklift driver. Well, you know, it's, it's much easier to prove you can't be a forklift driver than to say you can't do anything at all. Many times that own occupation provision in the private disability policy mainly lasts for two years. There may be a short-term disability part of it where it's, it's very, very you know, broad in terms of what you can't do, then the long-term kicks in where it's own occupation, then two years later, um, it becomes any occupation, which is more closely, closely aligned with Social Security. Or if there's a mental health component to it, you mentioned before that you know, your, your patients may have some depression associated with this. Well, long-term disability carriers um, are going to look for that because if they see depression as a disabling condition, they can limit many of the policy provide for you know, two years or three year limit on benefits for that. So I think when you're dealing with long-term disability, it's very much about the definition set forth in the policy. Um, they also 
will use uh, medical doctors to analyze the medical uh, results. You, you file your application and it's kind of similar to Social Security. You've got a claims adjuster who looks at it and they send it out to a, a medical uh, consultant, uh, typically not named uh, someplace in North Dakota, inevitably. You know, I wonder why they're all in North Dakota, but they seem to all be there. Um, and they, they look at the record and they say, you know, this person is not disabled. You can then appeal it and then you, you have to file it to go to federal court. Um, you know, they just, a lot, of, a lot of these private policies make it really difficult to win. I've had paralegals that worked for me in the past who have also worked for some of the larger private insurers. A lot of them will make you go through all the hoops, file the lawsuit, and then right at the very last minute, we'll back down and approve benefits. So it can be a challenge. You know, if you've paid, if you have a private policy that you've paid on your own for, um, they may be less uh, difficult to work with. The company-provided policies tend to be a lot more difficult to work with. If you work for a company and you, you know, paid as part of your, uh, you know, came out of your paycheck, you're paying for long-term disability. Those policies may be more restrictive, more difficult to work with. Um, they also, those policies may also have an offset, where if you win Social Security, you've got to pay back the long-term carrier for what they paid you during the months where there's overlap. So I have a lot of people who have long-term disability. They file it, they get their benefit. It's you know, $1,500 a month. We, I get them on social security disability. They get a lump sum, $35,000. The long-term carrier says, I'll take that long-term that lump sum. Thank you very much. Client's not real happy about it because you know, they had $35,000 in their hand one minute. Now the long-term carrier is saying it's mine. You know, their argument is that's how we price the policies. We based it on having this long-term, this lump sum available. So my big point here is if, you're, if you've got long-term disability, short-term disability, look very carefully at the policy. What are the definitions? What are the exclusions? What are the offset requirements? That makes a big difference. If you have your own agent, um, you know, if you've got a private policy with your own agent, there may not be an offset, but talk to your agent about that. If it's a company policy, there may be a benefits administrator, talk to that person. But, you know, don't be surprised by it. I mean, one of the things I'm, I'm really big on is don't be surprised by anything because, it, you know, if you just don't guess, don't assume the best uh, in those things. So private policies are their own traps, but the big ones would be, you know, is it A, is it a personal policy you bought or is it a company provided policy? The personal policies, generally speaking, are going to have less restrictions. The company policies are going to typically be more restrictive. They're going to be harder to qualify for, and there's probably going to be offsets and you're going to have to pay them back and you can't double dip. You, you can get the difference between the two. So if your long-term benefits 4,000 a month and your Social Security is 3,000, you'll get 3,000 from Social Security, 1,000 from long-term disability, but you don't get both. You get the higher of the two. Yeah, you know, my experience is it's often easier to get qualified for SSDI for my patients than these private disability policies, or at least it takes a lot longer to get yep. them. And yep. I think these are like own occupation policies make sense, you know, Physicians are always advised to get these because you could be a surgeon and have horrible arthritis and they tell you, well, you could be a telemarketer, that kind of thing. Right, right. exactly. Well, and I think that, you know, these, uh, yeah, that's exactly right. And, and insurance companies, you know, the policies, if you have an old policy, um, like I have a long-term disability policy that was written you know, years and years ago, and, you know, it's got much more lenient definitions because back then they didn't have all the, the statistics and numbers they do now. And so some policies are, you know, very, very lenient. Um, and what happens is if you get approved into one of those, one of those policies, many times the insurance carrier will try to buy you out of it. They'll approach you and say, how about if we pay you a lump sum and just buy you out of the thing so they don't have to keep paying on it. But yeah, they, they will fight you. And, and, you know, insurance companies are great. And, and, and look, it's a business. I get that. They're very good about taking your money for premiums. When it comes to paying out, they're going to look at it. A different office is going to look at it and say, how do we get this person off benefits? much more aggressively really than social security is. So long-term disability, you know, it, it's, it's a, you know, I tell people if you've got long-term disability and you have the option of filing for social security, even if it needs no more money because there's no, the offset is so complete, go ahead and do it because if long-term disability cuts you off, you've got the social security in your background. It's there. And, you know, social security, long-term cuts you off, trying to go back seven years later and saying, I became disabled in 2012 really hard to do. It's much easier to do it when it's, it's more recent. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, now, the last thing I was going to ask you is people often have this fear that if they're qualified for disability, 
are they being surveilled? Is a private investigator going to come after them or someone's going to look at their social media and, and see them coincidentally, maybe on a good day where they were walking okay and say, yep. you know, that person's not disabled, we're going to take away their benefits. Is that a real thing or is it mostly mythological? It is a real thing. I mean, they have an office, the inspector general office. And if someone, you know, if a, let's say that a, uh, an angry ex-spouse or a neighbor who doesn't like you wants to create trouble, they can file a fraud report. And that may trigger an investigation. I've seen it happen. Not very often it does happen where they will send somebody out to you know, surveil you. They'll take videos. They'll take uh, photographs. They'll look at your social media. So it does happen. I think it happens more in the long-term disability world or something in the workers' comp world, but it does happen. So I think that you know, when somebody is, is approved for benefits, I wouldn't say to be paranoid about it, but I would say be aware that, yeah, that theoretically could happen. I think I would not discuss the fact that you're in disability with anybody. It's nobody's business. Somebody may look at you and say, you know, that guy doesn't look like he's disabled. I'm going to go ahead and file a report. I get, I get these questions sometimes by emails, by email just randomly. You know, my neighbor's on disability. There's nothing wrong with him. Who do I report them to? Um, so that can happen. Um, you know, they can do their own. They can, they can look at your record and they can say, you know, this person, you know, appears they're working under the table or they're making some money. They could do it. Not very frequently, but it, it could happen. Um, I think with social media, I tell my clients, just put it on private. I mean, it's, first of all, it's nobody's business anyway. you got identity theft problems. But, yeah, you should not be posting on Facebook uh, that you're, you know, climbing a mountain someplace, you're going on vacation, and you're doing all these things. You may be having a really good day. But, um, you know, it, it, it's, if somebody at Social Security happens to look at it, not supposed to, but they, they do, if they look at it, and I've had judges tell me that they, they've looked at somebody's Facebook profile, they look at it and they see activities are inconsistent with disability, that's going to raise a question. So I'd say, you know, don't post stuff on Facebook, put it on private so only your friends can see it. Obviously, don't accept friends request, friend requests from people you don't know. And just, you know, be smart and, and don't do things you, that you really shouldn't, you know, you're not supposed to be doing. You may realize you do these things, you're going to be in bed for a week afterwards, but the wrong person takes a picture at the wrong time and it, and it screws you up. And that's not saying commit fraud. I'm just saying reality is people have good days and bad days. And you're having a really good day or just you know, you're, you're watching your kid graduate from school and you, know, you want to go out to dinner and there's pictures taken and you look really healthy, that could come back to, to bite you. So inspect, you know, inspections and, and surveillance is real. It's relatively rare. Usually it's, it's prompted by some sort of a angry neighbor or angry ex-spouse but not always. And social media, just put it on private, I would say. And, you know, change your LinkedIn profile to show you're not employed anymore. Just things like that. You know, be, be careful. Look, I've had people, you know, who've, who've had fibromyalgia, for example, which is kind of an invisible illness. You know, people on fibromyalgia many times are very, very um, diligent about posting things. I've had people have blogs, you know, hundreds of pages on their blog. And the judge sees it and like, well, if you can maintain a blog, with hundreds of pages in it, why are you disabled? Just don't give a judge any reason to do that. There's just no reason for it. So I just say minimize uh, your public profile out there. And you know, whether you're before applying for benefits or after you've been approved, um, there's no reason to create problems when there are none is my, my big picture answer to that question. Yeah, I think, unfortunately, the general public isn't necessarily in tune with the idea of an invisible disability in general. Mm -hmm. So I'd imagine a lot of these accusations are dubious, you know. Yeah. Well, as you pointed out before, MS can be, there's a lot of different symptoms. I mean, it could be cognitive primarily. I mean, I had a client years ago with MS, and that was primarily the issue, was cognitive. Um, and you looked at him, and he did not look. He didn't have any problems walking necessarily. didn't have a little spasticity in his, in his hands. But you wouldn't necessarily know he had MS, except that his cognitive capacity had dropped so low, that was what he got him approved on. But somebody looking at him is like, you know, he didn't have MS because the that's what the perception of MS is. So yeah, you just have to be aware that there are nosy bodies out there, people that have more time in their hands and they want to create problems, uh, or somebody you know doesn't like you for some reason. You're, you know, your kid beat up their kid. I mean, who knows what? And they will, and they will you know create problems for you. You know, and again, the biggest thing I see is angry ex girlfriends or boyfriends or ex spouses or families of ex spouses. Sometimes they want to get revenge and uh, they'll do crazy stuff. And you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. It can be a real problem. Yeah, and social media is definitely a double-edged sword. I think everyone should set their Facebook to private. If you ask me, I've seen some crazy stories. 
Yeah, absolutely. Look, I had a case years ago, not, not that long ago, really. Client with some musculoskeletal issues. Her Facebook profile is open, and there's a picture of her climbing on a ladder to clean her roof. And I asked her about it, and I said, you know, before, I'm like, what are you doing? Well, this was five years ago. Well, you know, she posted it two yeah. months ago. Right. But, you, know, you wouldn't know that. Um, I've had other people, you know, post, you know, there's, you know, family pictures. Of, yeah, just put it on private. It's just, it's nobody's business. And again, nowadays, especially identity theft, you don't want to put pictures of your young kids on there. It's just, it's a, it's a, it's just a wild west out there. And I think a lot of us don't realize, you know, how dangerous it can be. So yeah, you really want to uh, be real careful with social media, you know, Facebook in particular, because it's just, um, it's potential problems just waiting to happen. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, I think you answered all my questions. Is there anything else you want the world to know about disability in general? Um, again, the main thing is, I think, when you approach it to do so as a reluctant claimant, you don't want to be perceived as someone who has given up, who has labeled themselves as disabled, um, that you're doing this because you have to, you're appearing before the judge because you have no other choice, no other option. I think if you have that right attitude going in, that's a judges pick up on that more than you would think. Um, I think that, you know, con continuity of medical care is really important. Go to your doctor on a regular basis, do what the doctor tells you to do, you know, come across as being cooperative, compliant. Um, you know, if you're given a medication, at least try it. All those things really judges look at that and it really makes a difference uh, as opposed to someone who just, you know, is trying to, to do, they know more than everybody else. You know, you, you don't know more than everybody else. You don't know more than your doctor. And let your doctor help you as much as you possibly can. Judges pick up on that. And again, if you come across, if you make the difficult decision, and it is a really difficult decision to say, I am disabled. That, that word has got real, real significant connotations psychologically. If you've made that really difficult decision, then you know, listen to your lawyer, listen to uh, your doctor, and, and just you know, follow the protocol. Do what they tell everybody tells you to do. Uh, so that you're going to get better, number one, you know, help your health, and your chances for winning disability are going to go way up. So that, that's the big picture advice I would give anyone as well as I give all my clients as well. Well, thank you for taking the time to do the interview, Jonathan. And I can see your wisdom and experience really comes through. Again, I have some resources below from Ginsburg Law Offices, including the free disability survival card and some of his uh, other resources. Uh, but have a good day. And until next time, hopefully in a few months, the world will be a more beautiful place. I hope so. Thank you very much, Brandon. You take care.